This is the title page from the book Angels, Demons, and Gods of the New Millennium, which we're reading out of, which we're reading out of this uh, uh, for the last few days. And I uh, want to show you the little quote there at, at the beginning. The gods of one age become the devils of the age to follow. The priests look forward to the coming age and see only the end of the world. Well, that sort of sets the, the tone for uh, this, uh, one of the main essays in this book called The Procession of the Equinoxes and The Metamorphosis of the Gods. And we've been going through the astrological ages, the 2100 some years uh, that are the astrological ticks of the clock uh, as the sun appears to move backwards through the zodiac uh, at one degree every 72 years or something like that. And uh, uh, we have gotten to the discussing the age of Aquarius the one that we're supposedly in uh, right now. And many uh, uh, astrologers, good astrologers, fine astrologers, are, are still debating whether it started 100 years ago, 200 years ago, turn of the century, uh, 2012, or uh, 50 years from now or something. But pretty much they're in agreement that uh, the age of Aquarius, uh, we've entered it recently or we're in the process of entering it uh, right now. So for the, the sake of my essay here, I roughly just picked the year 2000 because that was sort of right in the middle of where the, the, the debate is. So we're in the age of Aquarius, and we're in that age of Aquarius Leo. Sun's in Aquarius, but right behind us is uh, Leo, and we're shish kebabbed on that, uh, on that pole. So... I'm taking the, the, the time to digress like this at the beginning because the question among magicians inevitably arises, is the Aeon of Horus the age of Aquarius? Is, are they the same thing? And the answer is kind of yes and yes and no. Uh, it might be more accurate to say that the beginning or the dawn of the Aeon of Horus, this time around, that kind of age, uh, the equinox of the gods kind of uh, age, like the age of Isis or Osiris and Horus, this time around, it's, it coincides with the uh, dawn of the uh, Aquarian age. So, yes, the Aeon of Horus, the beginning of the Aeon of Horus is roughly coincidental with the, the age of, uh, of Aquarius, at least at the moment, at 10 o'clock. That's my. That's the theory that I'm. I'm basically working with, and the basic the theory I'm basically working with in this book. So we are going to discuss the magical aeons, which are not the same thing as the astrological ages, uh, and we're going to discuss the last three. Uh, aeons at the at the end of this essay 
but right now we're going to finish up with the age of Aquarius, roughly 2000 AD to uh, uh, AD 4166. So no matter what you might think about the magical age, the age of Aquarius as a cosmological or astrological tick on the clock is going to last for another couple thousand years. The gods of one age become the devils of the age to follow. The priests look forward to the coming age and see only the end of the world. That's Duquette quoting Duquette. I do that often. Not being endowed with the gift of prophecy, I will not presume to predict the details of the Aquarian Age worship. We talked about the, the worship forms and the uh, spiritual worldview of the previous astrological ages in the previous days here. So I'm not going to presume to predict the details of Aquarian Age worship. I will nonetheless venture to predict that the gods of the Aquarian Age will be diametrically opposed to the gods of the Age of Pisces. Already all over the world, and remember this is written 25 years ago, okay? Already all over the world we see the decay of the repressive patriarchal establishments that have held sway for the last 2,000 years. It's almost comical to see how foolish and myopic the old establishments appear when juxtaposed with the rational goals of universal human rights, the women's movement, and global environmental awareness. Wow. I suppose, let me make sure I did this okay, I suppose it's very natural for the participants of a revolution to despise and demonize the icons of the overthrown administration. The early Christian church perpetuated a legend that at the moment of Christ's birth, all the oracles of antiquity fell silent. And an Egyptian sailor named Thomas heard an unearthly voice call to him from the Isle of Paxi, announcing, Thomas, the great god Pan is dead. As historically dubious as this story is, it serves to illustrate my point. Pan, who started life as the enduring, endearingly mischievous god of Thracian shepherds, eventually became the transcendent symbol of all the pagan gods. His ruddy complexion, horns, and cloven hooves became, in the Piscean age, the very image of Satan, the prince of evil. Now, I got a footnote here I, explaining that, how that myth started. I'm going to read it to you at the risk of digressing. The, quote, all great Tammuz, T-A-M-M-U-Z, the Babylonian sun god who was killed by evil forces, but eventually resurrected by his mother, wife Ishtar, was worshipped throughout the Mediterranean well into the Christian era. Just as Christendom drapes its churches in black and laments the crucifixion of Jesus on Good Friday, the holy mantra, Thamos Pan Megas Tethneke, the all great Thomas is dead was ceremonially chanted on the summer solstice by the devotees of Tammuz 
to observe the yearly death of their Redeemer, God, and Shepherd. It's far more likely that if Thomas, the sailor, heard anything, it was that well-known chant. For the worship of Pan remained alive and well for two centuries after this alleged epitaph. epitaph. Okay, digression over. Does this mean that Jesus Christ will become the devil of the age of Aquarius? Probably not. But the spiritual significance of his deity will in all likelihood be drastically different from that expounded by the exoteric doctrines of the last 2,000 years. And it will surely appear to the vestiges of the Piscean Age establishments that the new spiritual impulse is anti-Jehovah, anti-Allah, anti-Christ, and the gods of the new age are devils. Is this starting to clear up what's going on? After years of isolation on the Amun Amanita Muscaria rich Isle of Patmos. Now the Isle of Patmos it was known for hundreds of years to be magic mushroom central. Okay, that's where you exported it. You went to Patmos to score and that's where they put John alone sitting in a cave in Patmos surrounded by magic mushrooms. Do I have to draw you a picture? Okay, but I digress. After years of isolation on the Amanat, Ama, how do you pronounce this? Amanita, Amanita. Amanita. After years of isolation on the Amanita Muscaria, rich Isle of Patmos, St. John the Divine wrote down his visions of the awesome and terrible events which were to characterize the end of his age. This revelation was peopled with many strange and colorful spiritual personages such as the seven angels, the four horsemen, the lamb, the lion of Judah, the eagle, locusts, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, a fiery dragon, the, a serpent called the devil, and Satan, the archangel Michael, wild beasts, one from the sea, one from the earth, and perhaps the most colorful character of all, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. It is she who becomes drunk on the blood of the martyred saints, an act that serves as a catalyst to the climactic defeat of the enemies of the Lamb. As is often the case when one explores Kabbalistic literature, the villains of the exoteric narrative become the heroes of the esoteric interpretation, and vice versa. Naturally, at the beginning of each cycle, the gods of the New Age will appear at first somewhat sinister. The more one is committed to the magical formula of the Old Age, the more strange and evil the new gods will appear. Keeping in mind the fact that John, or whoever wrote the book credited to him, was sensitive to the spiritual changes at the dawn of the Piscean Age, can we in all fairness expect him to be an unbiased interpreter of the prophetic images that symbolizes the forces that would, in 2,000 years, bring the age of his beloved Savior to an end. 
perhaps for us, the whore of Babylon, the great dragon, or even the beast 666, are perfectly wholesome spiritual personifications of the mechanics of the growth spurt of a new age. The equinox of the gods and the magical pantheon of the new aeon. Before we move on, I wish to talk briefly about one more timeline of ages that is of singular importance to the subject of magical pantheons. To understand this timeline, we must pool what we've already learned about the astrological ages and view history from a much broader perspective. This chart is not measured by years or astrological ages. Instead, its lines of demarcation are set by the most fundamental evolutionary stages of human consciousness and relate directly to our most basic perceptions of reality. There is no mightier God than that which presides over the universal self-image of the race. Whenever this self-image is amended, the magical formula which expresses the essence of this God's character is also changed. Periodically, as our consciousness expands and our understanding of ourselves and the universe improves, we find that the old ways of doing business, including magic, are no longer efficient. The beginning of the, such periods of profound spiritual change is called the equinox of the gods. And according to a wide spectrum of modern ceremonial magicians, the planet has just recently experienced one. Earlier in this century, and I wrote this in the 20th century, early, earlier in the 20th century, uh, Aleister Crowley postulated that within racial memory, there have been three such magical aeons to which he assigned the rulership of the three principal gods of Egypt. Isis, Osiris, and Horus. We have just entered the aeon of Horus. The previous aeon was that of Osiris, and before that, Isis. The reader may ask at this point, what modification in human consciousness could possibly be so universal as to justify an equinox of the gods? The answer, not surprisingly, involves humanity's evolving perception of our relationship with the primary god of our solar system, the sun. In order for us to more easily understand the magical significance of the new aeon, let's take just a moment to trace the trajectory upon which our evolving solar consciousness has propelled us the last two aeons. And that's where we're going to leave it today. We will finish up this uh, essay soon. But tomorrow we will look at the significance and what was going on with human consciousness during the age or the aeon of Isis. Okay, that's where we're going to end it. Get on with your day. Continue to be good to yourself and be good to each other. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law. Love under will.